Well, as we exited the Torah and we begin our second week of preparation for studying the book of Joshua, we do it by discussing a subject that's key to our understanding of just who God is. And that is his name and the Lord's various titles that we encounter in the Bible. Also allow me to remind you that what we're doing is essentially reviewing the Torah before we transition into this first book of the former prophets, Joshua. And we are accomplishing this by following the history of the establishment of a set-apart people group called Israel. In fact, I would argue that the entire Old Testament, the Tanakh, uses the history of Israel as the motif, as the means that the Lord employs to establish His laws and principles on earth, which led to the enactment of His justice system, and subsequently it acted as the pathway to redemption that mankind so desperately needs. Well, we began and ended our first week of preparation around the life of Abraham. Now, before we proceed with our survey, a discussion of the many names of God's appropriate. Because in the Bible, we encounter a variety. Now, it's valuable for every Bible and, and history student to grasp that the Israelite culture sprang from Mesopotamian roots. The same roots Avraham was born into. It would in no way be incorrect to characterize Noah, the second Adam, if you would, who repopulated the world and his family as the first Mesopotamians after the flood, of course. Mesopotamian culture, or better, the many Mesopotamian cultures, was, as were all other ancient civilizations ever scientifically scrutinized, based on the worship of multiple gods. In the first few generations following Noah, mankind again perverted his relationship with God and quickly abandoned the truth that Noah taught. There is only one God. And as I pointed out earlier, it can be traced to Nimrod, the builder of the infamous Tower of Babel, as the person responsible for bringing together the various notions of paganism that had grown in fallen men's minds and establishing a religion. Now Nimrod, the black-skinned son of Cush, we now call his nationality Ethiopian, was a grandson of Ham. And recall that it was Ham who disgraced his father, Noah, and it was Noah's curse put upon Ham that was destined to produce descendants who would war against the descendants of Noah's other two sons, Shem and Japheth. Now Nimrod gathered his subjects together. He built a tower to reach up to his distorted view of heaven, and he declared war against God. And the results of Nimrod's religion was the notion of a spiritual universe that contained many gods, and these gods were arranged in a hierarchy with one god that was above all the other gods. And the title that the Mesopotamians gave that highest god was El. This was not monotheism, it's just that there was a god, the El, that was preeminent over all the other gods. And the various, as the various clans that once had once emanated from Noah now spread out and they grew into tribes, into nations and people groups throughout Mesopotamia, the Middle East, North Africa, beyond. They took with them then a fairly common grouping of gods. And although the names of these gods and their, their exact hierarchy would incorporate minor differences from culture to culture, language to language, they all represented the same basic mystery Babylon system that was developed by Nimrod and that was advanced by his wife Semiramis after his death. The Canaanite gods that Avraham and then later on the Israelites encountered in the land of Canaan were simply a continuation and a variation 
of the Nimrod Mesopotamian gods. How is that? Because the founder of the land of Canaan, Noah's grandson, Canaan, was himself born a Mesopotamian. He was raised in that system, so he took it with him, of course, when he migrated. Now, when God sent Avraham into the land of Canaan, he would not have found the Canaanite religious structure at all foreign to him. Rather, he would have been well familiar with it. It must be remembered that Avraham's father was a merchant of idols. Okay, that is, a maker, a seller of these carved figurines representing the, all the various gods of the Mesopotamian cultures. Now, when Abraham ratified God's covenant with him and he became the first Hebrew, Abraham's clan and offspring did not instantly swear off all the gods of old in exchange for the one true God of the universe. Almighty God would have simply become another God in their hierarchy of gods, even if he may now have been the El, the highest God above all the other gods. In fact, we get constant reminders in the Bible that the Hebrews forever struggled with idolatry. In fact, these worship of other gods even included Baal from, from their past. I mean, let us not make the mistake of thinking that they discarded one for the other. Rather, they accepted some hybrid mixture of God Almighty with lesser gods. And if you'll keep this in mind when we read the Old Testament, you're going to have a much more complete context for understanding these thought processes of the Hebrews in those days. Now, from among the scores of examples of Hebrews worshiping other gods can be found familiar biblical stories such as Rachel stealing her father's household deities when her husband Jacob fled from Laban of a brazen serpent god being worshipped in the holy temple of Jerusalem prior to 700 BC of Solomon who built the temple and yet allowed his hundreds of foreign wives and concubines to worship the pagan gods from whatever nation they'd come from but even more, Solomon permitted altars of sacrifice to these gods to be built right next to Israelite holy sites, including on the Mount of Olives. And he actually participated, we're told, in some of the cult practices. For this, he was constantly criticized by tribal elders and by prophets. Nearly all the kings, all the monarchs, that followed Solomon did essentially the same thing. And well before Solomon, when Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt, how can we forget the infamous golden calf incident is a prime example of people who worshiped the God of Israel, but then instinctively held on to and sought other gods as the occasions would arise. The golden calf the Israelites rebelliously constructed at Mount Sinai was simply a high Egyptian deity called the Apis Bull, which they were so familiar with as a result of their long captivity in Egypt. And throughout the Bible, we have prophets and the writers of the Holy Scriptures finding cause for anger against the Hebrews for their idolatry, for their insistence on accepting the existence of scores of false gods in addition to the Lord God Almighty. See, this is proof in and of itself of the prevalence of multiple God worship by the Israelites. Even at the same time, they were pledging their allegiance to Jehovah, Jehovah, El, God Almighty. Now, let us not be too harsh, though, in our judgment upon them. The Hebrews represented the first organized monotheistic religion. This was a radical notion in and of itself. The very concept of one God and only one God ran against the grain of all human beings' natures by this time. Now the Bible indicates that God's personal name is formed by the Hebrew letters Yud Hey 
vav hey. It's critical to grasp that most other words for God were, up to then, not names, but rather, rather fairly impersonal titles or characteristics. Now an interesting transformation happens that we need to pay attention to. And as we see this transformation happen in the Bible, it can get a little bit confusing. The Canaanite word El took on a double meaning. Not only did it indicate the highest God in that whatever pantheon of gods, it was now considered a formal name for that highest God. So in other words, it's not unlike in our culture where when we discuss the spiritual realm when we speak of a God as in a generic God or a one God among many, what I would say little g gods, and at the same time refer to the Judeo-Christian God as just God making his formal name, if you would, to be God, we see the same concept reflected in several places in the early scriptures, such as when Jacob named a particular place El Bethel. See, here we see this peculiarity where the word El is repeated. El, Beit, El. This is because El is being used both as a proper name and as a simple noun. So while a literal translation would be God, house of God, Beit means house, in proper meaning is the house of the God, El. That's what it's trying to tell us. Now later on in the Bible, El, the word El would drop its Canaanite origins and, and becoming the exclusively Hebrew Yehovah or Yahweh. Now theologians refer to these four letters representing God's name, yud heh vav -Hey, as the Tetragrammaton. Now, of course, YHWH or YHVH, whichever, are English alphabet characters which come from a pretty modern alphabet. In ancient Hebrew, these letters, as originally written by the finger of God himself on those stones, were, in the, were the Hebrew characters yud heh vav -Hey. And since, whether expressed in English or in Hebrew, these letters and characters are all, these letters and characters I just described to you, if you'll notice, they're all consonants. We have had to speculate at the vowel sounds in order that they could become a spoken word. Without vowels, you really can't form words. The commonly held pronunciation is Yahweh or Yahweh. This was later Englishized in the English word Jehovah that we commonly use in Christendom. Now, a long time later, about 500 BC, following the Babylonian exile of the Jewish people, Babylon, by the way, was back up in Mesopotamia, we find that the Jews began using the title El Ohim whenever referring to God or whenever the four letters yud heh vav -Heh, were encountered in the scriptures. It is believed that el Ohim was used because it was a commonly used word throughout the Middle East, and it simply meant God or the God, and likely it was borrowed from Babylonian culture, that culture they had been exiled into. Now remember, El was a native Mesopotamian word. It's interesting that in reality, the term el Ohim is a plural. So in modern English, we would be correct in translating Elohim to gods with an S, gods, plural. However, we'd miss the point because the plural did not always mean more than one in the Hebrew word structure. It could, as in the case of Elohim, simply indicate what's called preeminence or greatness. Now we see many Hebrew titles, not names, of God, beginning with the prefix El in the Bible. El Roi, God sees me. El Shaddai, El Elyon, God Most High, 
many more like this. This is unmistakably a result of continuing Mesopotamian influence. Titles, not names, titles of the God of Israel that revolved around this concept of El, the highest God of all gods, would certainly have been more understandable to the world at large at that time than the actual name of God, the exclusively Hebrew, nearly unpronounceable Yehovah or Yahweh. Now, by the time of Alexander the Great, as the Greco-Roman era dawned, which is around 300 BC, we find a taboo develop among the Jews against speaking the name of God. It's saying it out loud. And this taboo still exists today among religious Jews. It was probably a protective reaction due to the mystical theater of Greek gods suddenly being introduced into the Jewish culture, challenging the established influence of the ancient and the familiar pantheon of the Mesopotamian gods. Therefore, from about the third century BC on, we begin to see the usage of a new word for the God of Israel, Adonai. But as always, Adonai is not a name, it's a title. Now often it's mistakenly taught that Adonai is a Greek word since it appeared in the Greco-Roman era. That's not true. Adonai is a Hebrew word and its root word is Adon, which means Lord or Master. The suffix Ai makes it a plural word. However, unlike Elohim, which although is technically a plural form, actually it's used to denote greatness, the A-I at the end of Adonai is plural, and it means more than one. And this is not multiple God worship, but it introduces the concept that although there is one God, he manifests himself in more than one form. And this idea is borne out in the writings of the rabbis and the Mishnah, and this concept found its way, no doubt, into the Christian concept of the Trinity. So from around 300 BC forward, whenever Jews wanted to refer to God, they would use various terms. Elohim, meaning God, or they used the term Hashem, meaning the name. Or they might use Adonai, meaning my Lord or my master, a few other ones. They would do this, what's fascinating, they would do this even when reading Holy Scripture, when they encountered the Hebrew letters yud heh vav -Heh. So they stopped saying God's formal name and exactly how to pronounce it got lost. Now the early Gentile church fathers, did, of course, did not share this taboo against saying God's name. And in their desire to distance themselves from Judaism, they began to once again use God's actual name, Yahweh or Yehovah. Now Yehovah, which is how I think it was pronounced, was later Englishized into the word Jehovah. That is commonly used in the church today. Now, Jehovah became predominant in the church and the usage of other and older names and titles all but disappeared. But starting in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the ancient Hebrew terms such as Adonai, Elohim, Hashem, Yahweh, Yehovah, they began to find their way back into the writings of Christian theologians. Now the reason for that is twofold. First of all, because each of these Hebrew terms has a subtle but different meaning. They all mean the same thing. Or and our current better understanding of Hebrew and Greek texts has allows it, allowed us to use the word that more precise, precisely fits with the context of the meaning of that word. And second of all, there's been a recognition that our early church fathers intentionally fostered an anti-Semitic attitude by substituting Greek, Latin, and English words and phrases for the more straightforward and well-understood Hebrew originals. Well, after this long explanation about the evolving use of God's name, here's the important bottom line that we need to understand. More than 90%, well more, 
the 90% of the time that we encounter one of the titles of God in our Holy Scripture, Lord, God, whatever. The original Hebrew word in the Bible is actually Yehovah or Yahweh, God's formal name. Let me say that in a different way. More than nine out of ten times that our English Bibles use the words Lord or God, the original Hebrew is actually Yehovah. God's actual formal name is used over 6,000 times in the original Hebrew of the Old Testament. 6,000 times. But our modern translations reduce it to just a handful. Especially because in Christianity, the word Lord is virtually synonymous with Christ. When we read the Old Testament, too often when we run across the word Lord, see, we automatically take that to mean, oh, it must be referring to Jesus. But when we find that the Father's name, Yehovah, is actually what's written there, it changes the entire dynamic and meaning of that verse. Now let's move on with the progress of the Hebrew people in the form of Abraham's son, Isaac, or Isaac. Well, the Bible didn't tell us a lot about Isaac, Isaac. He wanders around some, not nearly to the extent of his father, Avraham. His wandering's not like an aimless person. Rather, it was that he was an owner of flocks and herds, and they needed fresh pasture and, on a regular basis. And he appears to have done pretty well for himself because he inherited his father's wealth. And God appears to Isaac, and as he, just as he did to his father, he gives him the same promise about fathering many nations, thus alleviating any doubt that it would be Isaac that would carry on the line of the covenant promises. Now, his wife, Rivka, Rebecca, gives him twin sons, Esau and Jacob, Esau and Yaakov. And Esau, being the first one out of the birth canal, then he was the rightful heir to his father Isaac's wealth and authority. But years later, and what the Bible describes as a very casual and impulsive transaction, Esau sells his birthright to his twin brother Jacob for the princely sum of a bowl of lentil soup. Actually, selling a birthright was somewhat common practice in that era. Well, so now we fast forward. Isaac's now about 135 years old. He's blind. And knowing that his death is near, he decides it's time to give the customary blessings to the firstborn of his twin boys, who is Esau. And although they were twins, again, as I told you, that Esau exited the birth canal first, so he was the firstborn. And the effect of this blessing is to validate that son's right to the family's wealth and to inherit the father's authority. Well, Isaac is unaware of Esau's dumb deal in selling his firstborn birthright to his brother Jacob. And Esau wants to keep it that way. And when Isaac instructs Esau to go hunting to get him some fresh meat for the blessing, his brother Jacob and their mother, Rivka, devise a cunning plan. The name Jacob turns out to be prophetic. In Hebrew, it means heel catcher. The Bible tells us that when Esau was born, Jacob was hanging on to his heel. However, heel catcher is probably not meant to be taken literally. It's thought by many scholars to mean deceiver. Well, before Esau can return from this hunt, Jacob disguises himself as Esau. He goes into Isaac's tent and he dupes the nearly blind old Isaac into giving Jacob the firstborn blessing. Isaac believes he's blessing Esau. Esau returns from the hunt. He finds out what's transpired. He's devastated. He pleads with his father, change the blessing. But by tradition, 
Such a blessing is irreversible for any reason. Rivka, the mother, knows her twin sons well. She fears that upon Isaac's imminent death, Esau's going to kill his brother Jacob because of his treachery. And upon their mother's urging, Jacob flees to his uncle Laban, far away, back up in Mesopotamia. On Haran, Jacob meets Rachel, Rachel, one of Laban's daughters at the family well. Now, Laban is Jacob's uncle. In other words, it's his mother's brother. And it's love at first sight. And as a fugitive, he has nothing else, with nothing else to offer. Jacob agrees to seven years of bond and servitude to Laban in return for the right to marry his daughter, Rachel. The seven years pass, and in a sure sign to, Jake, to Jacob that what goes around comes around, during this marriage ceremony, Leah, Laban's oldest daughter, is secretly switched out for Rachel. And by the time Jacob finds out, well, it's too late. Leah is now his legal wife. So in a promise for another seven years of servitude, Laban also gives Rachel to Jacob. Now make no mistake, Jacob was not an eager, foolish young man when he first married Leah and then Rachel. He was 84 years old. So the giving up of 14 years of his life for Rachel, uh, he probably thought that out pretty well. Now not only had Jacob received more than he bargained for, but his two wives, sisters, quarrel constantly for the next several years, which just happens to coincide with this growing hostility between Jacob and his father-in-law, Laban. Well, after completing 20 years of servitude to Laban, 14 for Rachel and Leah, six more in exchange for some livestock, Jacob, knowing something bad's going to happen, he gathers up his family and they flee. And as they prepare to secretly depart, Rachel steals her father Laban's household gods. And he takes, she takes those with them on their journey. Now, taking his daughters and grandchildren, that's one thing. But taking his family gods, oh, uh, that's another thing. So Laban forms a posse. And he pursues them and he catches up to Jacob and his family. Now, Rachel is a clever, determined girl. So, even after a thorough search of the campsite, her father can't find his missing gods. Now, the issue of the gods is important to Levon. See, because in that era, the person who possessed, physically possessed, the family gods could claim legal inheritance of the family's authority and wealth. So Rachel possessing her father's god, with gods was her ticket to everything her father owned. Levon's sons would not have been happy about this. Jacob survives this ordeal by agreeing to Levon's demands that he will never again take on another wife. Just those two sisters. Well, Jacob now moves on. He returns to Canaan. He now faces his brother, Esau, who's not too terribly happy with him either, and he doesn't really expect to survive this family reunion. Well, nearing his destination, Jacob has a very odd encounter with what some Bibles describe as an angel, others describe as the Lord himself, and finds himself in this all-night, it's very strange, all-night wrestling match. And whatever the meaning of this encounter, it produces a changed heart in Jacob, not to mention a permanent disability. But something else gets changed as well. Jacob is told by God that he's giving him a new name, and that name is Israel. Israel, Israel. So it's at this point in history, not before, that an identifiable people was created that God would call his own, the Israelites. Sometimes 
some Bibles, they'll actually refer to the Israelites as the Jacobites. Now, Jacob called Israel, his offspring and their descendants could rightfully be called Israelites, but only some of them would eventually come to be called the Jews. I'll expound on that confusing matter in due time. Expecting the worst, so now Jacob, from here on, alternately called in our Bibles, Israel and Jacob, back and forth, finally encounters his twin brother Esau, who it turns out is also changed. Tears flow. Israel offers gifts of reconciliation to his brother Esau. Esau, now a very wealthy man, refuses them. Israel insists, and they part in peace. <clears throat> Israel now heads for Shechem, which is by now a walled city-state in Canaan. This is the same place, this is the same place where God told Abraham this is the land he'd give to him and to his descendants. But in Abraham's time, Shechem was a little more than a small settlement. Israel purchases land for his clan from the king of Shechem. He's intent on settling down there permanently because being, being near a city brings mutual security and, and, and is formalized usually into a pact resembling a treaty. And part of any agreement of this type is that the residents of the city and the members of the people who wish to live outside the city walls become allies. And they join each other in fending off marauders. But things quickly sour when the king Shechem's son rapes Israel's only daughter, Dina. Dina. And it's probably had other daughters as well. And as her incense brothers lead a raid of revenge, leaving many of the city dwellers dead in their wake. Israel's heartbroken over these murderous actions of his sons upon the innocent people of Shechem. He knows they can't stay. So they pack up, they head to Bethel. God appears to Israel with assurance that the covenants given to Abraham, then Isaac, now to himself, they're going to remain intact. His beloved wife, Rachel, for whom he gave 14 years of his life to Mary, dies, giving birth to his 12th and last son, Ben Yamin. Benjamin. Well, it's now about 1800 BC. Back up in Mesopotamia, the Babylonian culture is becoming much more powerful, sophisticated. It's led by the continuing domination of the Amorites. And using the pyramid-like towers that they build, called ziggurats, they begin charting the skies as expert astronomers. Down in Egypt, the traditional Egyptian culture that has produced such an advanced civilization with its enormous pyramids, libraries, agriculture, science, all under a very strong central rule, it's all disintegrating. Foreigners now sit in the seat of Pharaoh in Egypt. But not just any foreigners. Bedouin sheikhs, Semites. These Bedouins were not mindless barbarians. They easily adapted uh, to the Egyptian ways, even adopted Egyptian names. But they were by nature tribal. They were wanderers. They didn't understand how to establish and maintain a large central government. So their rule was considered almost unbearable by the native Egyptians. Therefore, the so-called Hyksos rulers were never able to unite Egypt with the way the pharaohs had been able to before them. And Egypt declined for the next 150 years. Well, just a few years after Benjamin, was born, 17-year-old Joseph, Israel's openly favored son, fell victim to a vicious plot by his ten jealous and angry older brothers. Thrown into an empty water cistern and sold to a passing caravan of Arab slave traders, Joseph was, pronoun was pronounced to his father as having been killed by a wild animal. Israel was devastated. And he blamed his other sons for it, obviously unaware of the truth. And he would grieve for years to come. Well, the caravan winds up in Egypt, where Joseph is sold as a house slave to Potiphar, the chief steward to Pharaoh. 
And Joseph, young, good-looking, highly intelligent, greatly impresses his master. Nonetheless, he finds himself imprisoned as a result of false charges that were made against him by Potiphar's wife. And while Joseph Lanning was in prison, the Pharaoh began having these recurring nightmares. The local Egyptian wizards were unable to decipher these dreams. So Joseph was called upon to try. Pharaoh was so impressed by Joseph's accuracy, he promoted him to second in command over all Egypt. Potiphar now worked for Joseph. Joseph, now 30 years old, has not seen his family in 13 years. Well, meantime, back up in Canaan, where Jacob and his clan still resided, things were not good. Another famine had taken hold of the land. Israel's tribe was in danger of not surviving it. News arrives that Egypt had, through the debt management of a foreigner, Joseph somehow foreseen the famine and stockpiled much grain. And reluctantly, Jacob, Israel, sent his sons to Egypt to try and purchase some of that grain. And part of the reluctance was due to not wanting to lose another child. Because Israel had never recovered from the loss of his precious Joseph. Now this fear undoubtedly came from the common knowledge that the poorest of Egyptian society who were unable to purchase grain were selling themselves into bond servitude to Pharaoh's government in return for food for their families. <clears throat> this foreign Pharaoh of a divided country was using this famine and Joseph's abilities to construct a slave labor force to satisfy his ambitions. God used the situation to enable Israel to survive. Well, when Joseph finds out it's his brothers who have come asking to buy grain, he's crushed when they don't even recognize him. Hurt and angry, he toys with them for a while. But knowing that any revenge he might extract would only, further, would only serve to further hurt his father, very aged man now, Joseph not only gives them grain, he sends word to Israel that all his family should come to Egypt, where Joseph, from his position of power, can assure their survival. Well, Israel comes with his entire clan, which now numbers 70 individuals, not counting Joseph. In fact, there's many more than just the 70. But that's a discussion for another time. Israel dies there a few years later. But before he dies, he pronounces a blessing upon Joseph's two male children, Ephraim and Manasseh born by Joseph's Egyptian life. And this act is going to have an enormous impact on the future. This deathbed blessing, this cross-handed blessing, puts Joseph's younger child, Ephraim, ahead of Joseph's older child, Manasseh for the purposes of inheritance. But the blessing also included the adoption of those two boys by Israel, so they were no longer Jacob's grandchildren. He made them his own children. And this blessing had both immediate and prophetic effects, because by adopting these children, those children ceased being Egyptian they became Israelites. Now I want to pause here. I want us to take a look together at this much overlooked section of the Bible. Open your Bibles, if you would please, to Genesis chapter 48. Genesis chapter 48. Just before you get to Exodus. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're going to find it on page 55. Genesis chapter 40. A while later, someone told Joseph that his father was ill. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now Jacob was told, here comes your son Joseph. And Israel gathered his strength and he sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, saying to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous. 
I will make you a group of people. I will give this land to your descendants to possess forever. Now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be as much mine as Reuben and Simeon are. The children born to you after them, they will be yours. But for the purposes of inheritance, they are to be counted with their older brothers. Now as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died suddenly as we were traveling through the land of Canaan while we were still some distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, also known as Beit Lachem. And then Israel noticed Joseph's sons and asked, who are these? And Joseph answered his father, these are my sons whom God has given me here. And Jacob replied, I want you to bring them here to me so that I can bless them. Now Israel's eyes were dim with age so that he couldn't see. Joseph brought his sons near to him and he kissed them and he embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see you again, but God has allowed me to see your children too. Joseph brought them out from between his legs and he prostrated himself on the ground. And then Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand, Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and he brought them near to him. But Israel put out his right hand and he laid it on the head of the younger one, Ephraim, and put his left hand on the head of Manasseh. He intentionally crossed his hands, even though Manasseh was the first one. Then he blessed Joseph. The God in whose presence my fathers Abraham and Yitzhak lived, the God who has been my own shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has rescued me from all harm, bless these boys. May they remember who I am, what I stand for, and likewise my fathers, Abraham and Yitzhak, who they were, what they stood for, and may they grow into teeming multitudes on the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father was laying his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him. And he lifted up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head and place it instead on Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, no, don't do it that way, my father, for, for this one is the first one. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. He said, I know that, my son, I know it. He too will become a people. He too will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will grow into many nations. And then he added this blessing on them that day. Israel will speak of you in their own blessings by saying, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Israel then said to Joseph, you see that I'm dying. But God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your ancestors. Moreover, I am giving to you a Shechem, a boulder, the city of Shechem, more than to your brothers. I captured it from the Amorites with my sword and bow. What happened here? Why is this so important? Well, as I mentioned last time, the younger child of Joseph, who was Ephraim, was in essence given the firstborn or the double portion blessing that normally should have gone to the older child, Manasseh. But just as important, Jacob gave the birthright that should have belonged to his own firstborn son, Reuben, to his grandson, Ephraim. Reuben was not excommunicated from the family, but he was replaced for inheritance purposes with Joseph's son, Ephraim. How do I know this was the result? Listen to 1 Chronicles 5.1. Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Jacob, for he was the firstborn, because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Jacob, so that he, Reuben, is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. So here's something we must put into our minds, and we've got to just hold on to it now for a while. The firstborn right of inheritance for Israel's, for Jacob's children, winds up not going to the rightful heir, Reuben. Instead, 
Those rights are given to Ephraim, who's actually a grandchild of Jacob, a son of Joseph. But one of the effects of this cross-handed blessing was that Jacob also adopted away these two grandchildren from Joseph, and he made them his own sons. Joseph protested. Jacob said that all of Joseph's future sons could be his sons. That is, Jacob said, okay, I won't adopt away any more of your sons from here. That's strange. Very strange. We just don't find anything else like it in the scriptures. I mean, what possible reason could there be for him doing such a thing? Well, first and foremost, these two children were no longer Egyptian. Because he adopted them, because he adopted them, he took these Gentiles and made them Hebrews. Keep that in your mind. Now let's fast forward now, several hundred years in the future, to the time of the Exodus from Egypt. We're going to cover the Exodus next week, at least part of it. We're going to go to the time of Solomon, king of Israel. Solomon is ruler over united Israel, but that's going to change almost immediately after his death. His son inherits the throne right away. Turmoil and a civil war. The nation of Israel is divided into two kingdoms. The Bible refers a number of ways to these two kingdoms. Most typically, it's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, or as the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. Judah in the south, Israel in the north. But there's a problem here. You see, the northern kingdom was not really called Israel after just a very short time. Calling that kingdom Israel is a pretty recent redaction in our Bibles. The oldest manuscripts clearly call the northern kingdom Ephraim. By now, of the 12 original tribes of Israel, two, Judah and Ephraim, had become dominant and they ruled over the other 10 tribes. In biblical times, Territories tended to be named after the dominant tribe who occupied that area. So the two kingdoms that resulted from the civil war of Israel were called by the names of the two tribes that controlled them. Judah in the south, Ephraim in the north. We fast forward again. This time about 200 more years. Judah has struggled to stay separate from his pagan neighbors, close to God. The other hand, Ephraim has worked hard to associate itself with its neighbor's gods. Assyria is now a regional powerhouse. It attacks Ephraim. It empties the land of its people. The people of Ephraim are scattered all over the Assyrian Empire. They're absorbed into the myriad cultures of Asia to the point that most of them simply lost their Hebrew identity. Ephraim is no longer a people. Most of the people in Ephraim don't even know their heritage. Much of the 10 tribes that formed Ephraim mixed its Hebrew genes with the Gentile people of the world. And from the Western perspective, Ephraim had become lost into the world of Gentiles. Now, please pay very close attention to this. From Genesis forward, Ephraim and Judah, at times called Israel and Judah, you'll find in your Bibles, are referred to as the two houses of Israel. Together they make up the whole house of Israel. That is, these two halves, two houses of Israel, together make up all of Israel. Now, if this is a vast background, we're going to fast forward again. The prophet Ezekiel who's writing about 130 years after Assyria conquered Ephraim, writes about a prophetic future for the people of Ephraim. He does it in Ezekiel 37. It is fascinating. And for all believers of our time, it ought to be earth-shaking if we truly understand what's being said. Let's read it.
Open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 691. Ezekiel chapter 37. With the hand of Adonai upon me, Adonai carried me out by his spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He had me pass by all around them. There were so many bones lying in the valley, they were so dry. And he asked me, human being, can these bones live? And I answered that, and I Elohim only, you know that. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones. Say to them, dry bones, hear what Adonai has to say. To these bones, Adonai Elohim says, I will make breath into you and you will live. I will attach ligaments to you, make flesh grow on you, cover you over with skin, put breath in you. You will live. You will know that I'm Adonai. So I prophesied his order, and while I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. It was the bones coming together, each bone in its proper place. And as I watched, ligaments grew on them, flesh appeared, skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And next he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, human being. Say to the breath that Adam my Elohim says, come from the four winds, breath, and breathe on these slain so that they can live. So I prophesied this order. The breath came into them and they were alive. And they stood up on their feet, a huge army. And he said to me, human being, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And they are saying, our bones have dried up. Our hope is gone. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy. Say to them that Adonai Elohim says, my people, I will open your graves and make you get up out of your graves and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I'm Adonai when I've opened your graves and made you get up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit in you and you will be alive that I will place you in your own land. And you will know that I, Adonai, have spoken. I have done, says Adonai. And the word of Adonai came to me, and he said, You, human being, take one stick and write on it for Judah and those joining with him among the people of Israel. Next, take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel are joined with him. And finally, bring them together into a single stick so that they become one in your hand. And when your people ask you what all of this means, tell them that Adonai Elohim says this, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, together with the tribes of Israel who are joined with him, and put them together with the stick of Judah and make them a single stick so that they became one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write are to be in your hand as they watch. And then say to them that Adonai Elohim says, I will take the people of Israel from among the nations where they've gone and gather them from every side and bring them back to their own land. I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. One king will be king for all of them. They will no longer be two nations. They will never again be divided into two kingdoms. They will never again defile themselves with their idols, their detestable things, or any of their transgressions. But I will save them from all the places where they've been living and sinning. I will cleanse them so that they will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them. All of them will have one shepherd. They will live by my rulings and keep and observe my regulations. They will live in the land I gave to Jacob, my servant, where your ancestors lived. They will live there. They, their children, their grandchildren, forever. David, my servant, will be their leader forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant. I will give to them, increase their numbers, set my sanctuary among them forever. My home will be with them. I will be their God, they will be my people. The nations will know that I'm Adonai, who sets Israel apart as holy, when my sanctuary is with them forever. 
Here we find what has come to be known today as the 2-6 prophecy. And it says that in the end times, the latter days, Ephraim will somehow be rejoined with Judah. The two halves, the two houses of Israel, will once again be united. They will become a whole, the whole house of Israel. Now let that sink in for a moment. How could Ephraim, most of whom are so mixed with Gentiles that they become Gentiles, millions of people who don't even know they have ancestral roots to the tribe of Ephraim, and some who do, do suspect the connection, but they can't prove it. How are they going to be reunited with the tribe of Judah? Who's Judah today? Who's Judah? The Jewish people. Jews are what the members of the tribe of Judah have been called since the time of Babylon. Now, surprise. Another of those prophetic dominoes has taken a tumble. We now know that while almost all the Israelites who formed Ephraim joined themselves to the Gentiles and have essentially become Gentiles, remnants of each of the ten tribes that formed Ephraim remained intact with an ingrained and uninterrupted memory of their Israelite heritage. The largest one that's currently known is Manasseh, not surprisingly, Manasseh. And it consists, it's estimated, of about 2 million people. And the Israeli government has now recognized that these 10 lost tribes aren't as lost as they thought. Yet because Israel is officially a Jewish nation, and because Jews are genetically and tribally the tribe of Judah, what does Israel do with millions of members of those 10 Israelite tribes who've been rediscovered and want to come home to join their Jewish brothers. What a dilemma. The difficulty lies in the stance of those 10 tribes that while they're Israel, they're not Jews. They're not descendants of the tribe of Judah. They're descendants of 10 other Israelite tribes. Because the tradition grew that today's Jews are all the remains of Israel, most of the world's Jewish communities are confused and perplexed how in the world we handle this reality. What are we supposed to do? Yet this second house of Israel has been found, and their reemergence. It's prophetic. We just read it. The Israeli government is now allowing them to return. And the church is completely unaware that the two sticks prophecy of Ezekiel 37 is happening right now. The last time we were in Israel, which was just a few months ago, as we were heading down the long runway, gangplank, I guess you could call it, towards the International Terminal, a whole group of the tribe of Manesha was heading in the other direction to dip drums and flutes and flags. We were standing there watching Manesha, one of the ten lost tribes, returning to Israel with our own eyes. And this is not the first time we've seen it. And they've come by thousands. We'll continue next time.